Again, all the way from the US, mashallah. Okay, you'll be glad to know we are on our final speaker of today, inshallah. Our final speaker, we will be re-inviting back to the stage, Dr. Aldaf Hussein, who will, look, who will discuss with us the importance of making an impact by making alliance inside and outside Muslim communities. Just a reminder of Dr. Aldaf, he is an assistant professor in the School of Social Work at Howard University in Washington, DC. And he also serves as the vice president of the Yaqeen Institute for Islamic Research. Dr. Aldaf Hussein. A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, wa salatu wa salam, ala ashraf al-anbiya wa mursaleen, Sayyidina Muhammad, wa ala ali ashabi ajma'een. My dear respected brothers and sisters, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. There, there are three rules of public speaking. It is stand up to be seen, speak to be heard, and then sit down to be appreciated. So I hope to be appreciated very soon. And then there's another story where there was a man who was speaking and he spoke for so long that slowly everybody left. Nobody said anything, they just quietly started leaving until he looked up and he thought he was done, but he saw one person still there. So when he finished, he said everything was on his heart. He finished and he came down and he said, everybody left. He said, why did you stay? The man said, I'm the next speaker. So, thankfully, my sister Zahra, mashallah, delivered the, 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 the message that needed to be heard by those who are here, and I am that last speaker, <laughs> and you still stayed. The focus is on alliances within and outside the community. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the Quran, in verse, Surah Al-Imran, verse 102, Advise, uh, uh, brings us into a thinking about taqwa. And it says, Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu, ittaqullaha haqqa tuqatih, wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun. O you who believe, be conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as He deserves that you be conscious of Him. Taqwa is God consciousness. Taqwa is rarely God fearing. Fear is a component of consciousness. I'm conscious if I'm driving. If, if I'm not conscious and I'm driving and I don't see the police and I'm speeding, nothing happens, I'm, I'm getting the ticket. But if I'm conscious enough and I see my GPS and it tells me there's a police, there's some level of consciousness where I adjust my behavior. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to say, وَأَتَسِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا وَلَا تَفَرَّقُوا And hold on and hold tight together to the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the verse goes on to say that He literally found you. He literally found you as, en you know, as enemies of one another, on the brink, if you will, of breakdown and, and all kinds of collapse. And he brought you, for Allah, that he brought together your hearts. This verse is very important, subhanAllah. I'm raised in the United States. I'm giving this talk in Manchester, England. This verse was used as the slogan of FOSIS, the federation, the founders of FOSIS the Federation of Student Islamic Societies. Then when they left here, they finished their bachelor's and master's degree. When they left to the United States to pursue their PhD, they used the same verse to form the Muslim Student Association, which was an alliance of student organizations on campus, and they stuck with the same, وَأَتَسِمُوا بِحَبْدِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا وَلَا تَفَرَّقُوا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us through the Quran principles of how to come together, of principles of how to join together, of the fact that the, the life of the Prophet ﷺ is filled with examples, actual examples of taking, for example, the Hilf al Fudul. This is an alliance of virtue that was formulated because a person weak in power or weak in society was being abused by those in power and he was not getting his right in terms of business. And he went to complain 
and those who were conscious of their responsibility to society and to protect the rights of the vulnerable and the oppressed and the weak formed the alliance Hilf al Fudul. And the Ali Salam said after Nubuwa, after prophethood, that if I was called to such an alliance again, I would join it. Meaning that the essence of the alliance is the essence of Islam. The essence of that alliance was to protect the, the ones who are least in power among us. And so when we look at the, even the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, and you could go on discussing that, when we look and analyze from the outside, sometimes we are too hard on ourselves. We are too tough on ourselves. And I want to begin as we close this session today by looking at what is all working with the community. Indeed, they are challenging times, but they are optimistic times. By far, we have the most number of Muslims that have ever lived on earth. We have people, mashallah tabarakallah, who are literally learning about the religion in the privacy of their own home with a device. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is guiding their hearts to come to Islam completely on their own. Some of them have never met a Muslim. Never met a Muslim. Imagine the Prophet ﷺ lived how many centuries ago and his message prevails despite this massive systematic you know, attempt at maligning our teachings. So we're growing in number. We're growing in the number of masajid. We're growing in terms of the number of young indigenous scholars all, all over the West. We're growing in the number of people, by the way, the Why Islam, where Dr. Dr. Sabil Ahmed is with Gain Peace, but Why Islam is another division of Dawah for Ikna. They chart literally all the inquiries about Islam last year in 2023. They could say without a doubt, by calculations, every six minutes, every six minutes, a person was requesting a Quran. In our lifetime, this is happening. And despite of us, not because of us. Despite our dysfunction, Allah is guiding people every six minutes in one hour. That means 10 people requested the Quran. So the urgent issues that cause us to move towards an alliance are pressing, both domestic and abroad. Domestically, it is impossible to ignore that we as Muslims came, we established ourselves, established institutions, but we have created an elite class of Muslims. I take no pride in saying that yes, I am part of that elite class of Muslims. Leadership, leadership opportunities, being able to be in board meetings and advising and strategizing, fundraising, all of these are very privileged activities of the elite. The bulk of the Muslims are untouched by our Islamic work. So the internal alliances will mean that the quality of Islam is protected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but the quality of Muslims, you and I have to work on it. Sajjad Bhai last night met me late night, subhanAllah, some of the burdens of leadership. By the time I arrived from my talk in Leeds and I took the, uh, I was driven here, I arrived around midnight. He met me, we met for another hour. He took me within three minutes. Just with, you know, uh, in, in Manchester alone, he showed me nine different masajid within just a, a matter of three minutes. What is the quality of those Muslims? Where is the internal alliance where the boards and the imams of those nine masjids say within three minutes, we should have the most powerful dawah system anywhere on earth. No person in that radius should ever be hungry. No one should be without a job. No one should be suffering in silence from domestic or interpersonal violence. This type of alliance means I have to shed my racial, ethnic, nationalistic, madhabi, tahriki, all of these pride elements. I have to be able to say I must remain humble because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not raise me and ask me on the day of judgment, were you the secretary or the treasurer? or the president of this board? Were you actually, in fact, on, on any leadership committee? What did you do in such and such position? They, I will be questioned about what I did to learn Islam myself, to practice it, and then to convey it immediately to my family, which is why you have, Qu'anfusikum wa ahlikum. 
Save yourselves and your families from the fire whose fuel is men and stones. So the internal, the urgency of the internal alliance is huge. And I cannot say to you in words how painful it is to know that there are divisions among us where people will literally be late to pray Maghrib prayer and be driving by a house of Allah but do not go inside to pray because I don't want to be seen as if I prayed in their masjid. It is the house of Allah. In America, we are buying churches and synagogues that are for sale, that we're converting into masajid because those faith leaders say, we don't want anyone else to buy these homes. The interfaith alliance is on principle. They say, I hope you buy it so it doesn't become a nightclub or some other business who want it to be a house of Allah, a house of worship. We actually rent some churches and synagogues to pray in now. In Washington, D.C., in the capital of the, uh, of the United States, there are several masajid, but the one closer to the, some of the main office government buildings is a church. We rent the church. So I am able to go and pray inside a church to fulfill my Jummah obligation, but I will not go to this masjid because it is Salafi or Sufi or, or you know, Jama Islamiyah or Ikhwan or this and that. These dysfunctions eat away at the alliances. These dysfunctions are transmitted to our children and they will grow up saying, I watched my parents miss prayer, but not go to this masjid or speak ill of this other community. And so we have to ask ourselves, what can we do about that? And I'll, close, I'll start to close with that. We're also facing, I mean, the challenge of, of our youth, of the ability to be able to motivate them and get them together. They're suffering all these different problems. The alliance within the Muslim community will ensure the, trans, you know, the transfer of technology. What is working? What are the best practices that are working in this part of the, uh, the UK and in that part of the UK? What's working great for young girls, for young boys, for young women, for newly married, about to be married, wanting to be married? All of these things within that alliance can happen. But we cannot sit still. The genocide in Gaza is live streamed. But nobody asks about Kashmir. Palestine and Kashmir occupied at approximately the same time for now over 80 years. So the genocide goes on. What does a Kashmiri feel? I feel sad. All of them are being killed. Children are being killed. But then they look and they say, my homeland, nobody talks about the occupation of my homeland. The Rohingya brothers and sisters, they say, I am sad. My heart is broken that another child died in Gaza. But my own genocide is happening and nobody talks about that. The Uyghur brothers and sisters in China. I'm sad, my heart is broken about Gaza, but nobody talks about my people and they're dying. And so we have to look at the impact of these alliances. If we are internally strong, if not a single person can enter our community, infiltrate our community, and break our Muslim alliances apart, alliance apart, then believe me, we will be able to stand up. Stand up and demand from our governments the due diligence it takes to not only support, support when a genocide is occurring to call for a ceasefire without a doubt, but they will understand that these same people who demand uh, us accountability for international issues are the same people demanding accountability for domestic issues. And their alliance is strong, not only within Muslims, but also within the other faith and, and no faith communities. And who are those people? They're also looking for the same issues, working on the same issues. If we had more time, we'd talk about principled engagement. And so I want to close with these five things very quickly. Number one, an alliance must have clear goals. Don't just come together and say, let's be unified. Unified about what? Number two, have clear roles and responsibilities for everyone, especially the leadership of the alliance. I have seen the dysfunction of Muslims. I have painfully felt the dysfunction of Muslims where they come together and it literally falls apart because the ego of the people involved. I can't believe that you didn't list my name the first to speak. There were eight speakers and I wanted to be, I had to be the first. That's what you're going to now quabble and quibble and argue about. Our organization should have been listed the first. It can't be. Your organization starts with the letter Z. But why should we list it first? It's listed alphabetically. The dysfunction is going to destroy us. 
have clear roles and responsibilities so you understand everybody comes not equally but equitably to the alliance. Number three, clear targets to meet certain deadlines and we need to see are we meeting those deadlines? Are we actually achieving what we set out to do? Number four, regular sessions to evaluate the alliance. There must be accountability. Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu cried and cried and cried from just personal muhasaba. He cried so much from personal muhasaba, it led into his khilafah. When he was the khalifa of the, of the ummah at that time, he was so dedicated. Dedicated not only to the accountability of, his, of himself, but his position. We have to stop being so afraid to hold each other accountable. You are not working out as the leader. I am so sorry. I don't know what is happening in your personal life, but you've missed meetings. You are not able to function and we need to move you out. We must be able to move you out. And no one should be offended if I'm not functioning and people want me to go. I should in fact offer to step down from my position. The alliance will suffer simply because my ego cannot take the fact that I should resign or leave the position. And last but not least, we must need know when to dissolve the alliance. If it's simply not working, if it's dysfunctional, if it's causing more pain, more harm than what it was intended to do. Or, inshallah, if the goals have been met, which in my humble opinion as I close, I don't think the goals will have been met. It will be the dysfunction that will outweigh everything else. So I close with dua. I close by making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that each and every one of us, either who is here now or who listens to the recording, understands that you individually have the awesome responsibility, you have the awesome privilege of being alive at a time when so much is going good with Islam. And yet you have the awesome burden and the responsibility to do something. Don't just sit there and say, I can't. No, every one of you, every one of us has a role to play. And in fact, if we can move the needle just a slightly, just slightly through our effort, even if nobody recorded it, you had no position, you had no acknowledgement, nobody put it on Instagram, nobody tweeted about it, no Snapchat occurred, the angels will have recorded. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala indeed help us to live and to die as Muslims and to be the ones who promote these effective alliances. Jazakumullah khairan for having us. May Allah bless you. May you have a safe trip home. And inshallah, may you continue to serve your families and your communities. Jazakumullah khairan. Salaamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Let's make this time with only love.